Father, we thank you for your presence. We know, Father, that it is only because of the blood of Jesus that we're allowed to come into your presence. Father, we don't take that lightly, God. But, God, that we, we say thank you for your blood. We thank you for your presence, God. And thank you for the authority. Jesus, you have overcome death, hell, and the grave. Nothing is too hard for you. Anything is possible with you. And, Father, we put our trust and our, our faith in you. You are good. You are faithful. You are strong. And we put our faith and our hope in you. We rest in your goodness. God, I, I thank you. That, that I can come to you today and, and just say thanks. God, I, I thank you that I, I can come to you and worship you in, in spirit and in truth and, and know that you're here with us. Father, I, I pray that your presence, Lord, would, and your anointing would increase. Let your power increase in each one of our lives, God. Let us allow the Holy Spirit full reign in our lives today. Father, we need you. We need you. We need what you've done for us. We need what you're going to do in us. We need the plans that you have for us. We need you. And so today, God, we come and, and, and we just thank you that you are for us, that your plans are good and that they're, you're going to prosper us and, and we're going to see growth in every area of our lives, God, as we continue to, to give our lives over to you. I ask you, Father, that you help us to be salt and light everywhere we go as we shine the authority that you've given to us, as we just sang about. We know in ourselves we can do nothing, but through you we can do all things. For you cause us to be more than overcomers. We love you. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. Well, guys, you can go ahead and be seated. Uh, if you're tuning in online, I know you're like, what happened there? Well, um, we're still working out the whole, the whole bugs about how to be able to put worship online. Um, so you guys, you know, if you want, you can actually be in prayer about that as well. So that way we can just stream the whole thing. But thank you for, for staying tuned. I'd like to go ahead and just go over a couple of announcements with you. Uh, some things that will be coming up. Of course, this week... We're going to continue to have prayer on Thursday nights. Uh, if you're interested in that, just message the church. If you're online, you could just comment down below, hey, where's that happening at? Or uh, you can contact us through the contact form on the website. And, you know, we can give you some, some directions on, on where to go and what to do and stuff. Um, as far as I know, that's, there's also a link that we can send you virtually, too. You know, if you're like, I don't really feel comfortable going with still a bunch of people. I, I want to stay home or I'm not feeling well, which we encourage you to stay home. We can send that link out to you well, though, and that way you can join in the, the virtual prayer meeting. Um, it's actually a neat little thing. I've done it a couple of times and, and joined in and um, virtually. It, it's a little different, but it's, it's been kind of pretty cool, hasn't it, Liv? Yeah, awesome. Uh, a couple of other, or another announcement is remember we're still giving away that free ebook and the master class for uh, the parenting class. Now, some of you may be going, but hey, I don't have kids, or my kids are already grown, or have a teenager who knows what to do with it. No, I'm sorry, I'm joking, <laughs> Hannah. Um, that class is actually has to deal a lot with relationships. And so if you're wanting to grow and learning how to have good relationships with other individuals, you can still use some of the, shall I say, techniques and teaching that's available in that book and in that master class in your own life to help your own relationships out. So I encourage you, take advantage of it. Uh, normally it would be $25, but the church has already paid it for you. You get the free ebook. You can download to your computer, to your tablet, to your phone, read it. The master class is all online. Um, you can work at, it at your own pace, or you can work with the group virtually if you like. So uh, that's, that's all up to you on how you want to do that. As far as other announcements, I cannot think of anything else. I believe that's actually all of the announcements we have right now. Um, so, are you guys ready for an awesome day today? Yeah? I'd love to say I see all your smiles, but a lot of y'all, I can just tell you're smiling from your eyes, but, you know, I, no lie. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you can tell I go like this a lot. No lie. I saw somebody the other day on Facebook. They had like a cutout of their mask, and it was plastic. 
So you could actually see their mouth. And so they were like smiling. So you saw their smile, but it was still in the mask. It, it was interesting. It was different. Um, I told Heather, I think I'm going to get one of these things, but like with the skull mask or whatever. And so if I have to teach in a mask, I'll look like that. My, the kids might actually listen to me and be a little nervous. You think that'll work, Livy? If I show up with this mean looking mask on, then just put the whole thing up. Yeah? Why not? I don't know, right? Why not? Have fun with it. Well, um, like I said, I wanted to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, as far as offerings, I know some of you are still um, desiring to give to the Lord. Uh, we have a couple of options for you. Of course, if you're here today, we have an offering basket over here. On your way out this, the exit door, you can just drop it into the offering basket. Um, and then, of course, we'll use sanitation techniques to make sure we get it all out and, and counted and stuff. But you may drop it in here. If you like, you can put it in the mail and send it to our post office box. Uh, the address is online for those that are, on, that are online. You just go to our website. It gives you the post office box right there. There's also the option to give online. If you go to the website, you'll see in the top right corner, give now. You can click that link. Now, if you have been giving online, it's going to come up a little differently now. Uh, we've just changed, I guess you'd say, our giving platform. And so the web page is going to look a little different whenever you click give now, but it'll still have our logo on there. That way you'll know that you're still on the right page. So uh, if you have any questions, you can always contact us and, and we'll be glad to to help you through the process of being able to give online. You can also set up what's called recurring giving. So that way you can set it up and say, hey, on the, I don't know, third of every month, I want to give X amount. And you can set it up that way. And then automatically, just like you're doing an automatic payment for one of your bills, the third of every month, there'd be a bank draft from it. And then you don't, you just set it and not even have to worry about it. So make it as easy as possible. So if you, uh, as you give, Realize you're giving to the Lord, and the Lord will bless your faithfulness. And I want to personally thank you for your faithfulness, for those that are continuing to give. Um, it is an act of faith whenever you give. Because you're saying, I am not trusting in this money, but God, you are my provider, which ultimately he is. Amen? Amen. Well, what do you say... We go ahead and get started. Are you ready? Awesome. Well, guys, if you'll go ahead and put... Oh, you already... Good job. I'm not worthy. Good job. Oh, they're, they're on the ball. Um, as I said earlier, I want to thank you for coming out today. And if you weren't able to come out or you were not comfortable coming out and you're joining us online, thank you for joining us as well. You are just of as much a part of the North Point family as those that are joining here today. You are vital to the ministry of God that he has here. And so thank you for joining in as well. Uh, right now, if you're joining in online, go ahead and just like in the comments area, let us know where you're joining in from. We have some people online, even here, that are watching that's going to be able to dialogue with you. As we go. See, even the angel said yes to that. Did you hear that? They was like, do 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 It's one of those harps. Gabriel must have been playing the guitar or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> do you like that? So, join in. Let us know where you're, you're from. Uh, they'll also be there in case you have a prayer request. They'll be able to uh, take your prayer request. And we can make sure that we get to pray for you uh, specifically. Uh, if you don't feel quite comfortable putting that prayer request down there in the comments sections, make sure you go ahead and put it in the private messenger section and let us know because we are here to pray for you. And, and guys, for those that are here, we are here to pray for you as well. Let us know if there's something that we can pray with you guys about because I am a firm believer. I'm already getting off the nose. I'm a firm believer in a God that not only hears our prayers, but that he's alive and active and can move in a situation that you're in. And, and we can actually see miracles take place and the healings take place. And no matter what difficulty you're in, I believe in a God that can get us through that difficulty. All right, so make sure that you let us know as well, okay? Um, today, we are beginning a brand new series. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Come on. 
Work with me here, people. Come on. All right. Yay, there you go. We are beginning a brand new series. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be exploring how to rebuild our life to have a solid life. Hashtag solid life. The text we're going to be using over the next couple of weeks is the Bible. No, I'm joking. We are going to be using the Bible, but we're specifically going to be using the book of Haggai. Some people call it Haggai. That is going to be the text that we use. Never preached from the book of Haggai before, like the entire book. It's new for me. But I can promise you that we're going to be dealing with some issues on how you personally can rebuild your life and have a solid life that can handle the storms of life. I'd like to begin by today by asking you a few questions. Have you ever wished for a life that was full of accomplishment? Yes, thank you. Have you ever wanted to fulfill a dream that God has placed within your heart? Yes, good. Have you ever wanted to do all that God has called you to do? There you go. Awesome. Have you ever wanted your life to be a... Hashtag solid life that it could stand no matter what came your way. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to look today at how we can have a hashtag solid life. This series deals with you being able to accomplish everything that God has called you to accomplish. To be able to fulfill the purposes that God has placed in your heart and in your life. To be able to fulfill the dreams that he's placed deep down that other people may not have even known about. That is what this series is going to deal with. You see, God is calling each of us to something greater. Not for our own selves, but for his glory. So this series is going to be dealing with how do we put into effect the things that needs to be put into effect to accomplish those things for his glory. I don't know about you, but I want a solid life. I want a hashtag solid life. See, that, that's a tweetable thing there, right, Hannah? Maybe we should be taking some pictures of ourselves, and when we place them on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, we put it with that hashtag solid life to remind ourselves, because that is what God is calling us to. We're not going to crumble and fall as difficulties arise. We're not going to sway back and forth with the news reports, but we're going to be steady in this time of confusion, in this time of a pandemic, in this time of basically civil unrest, because our life is going to be hashtag solid life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, before we ever get into the book of Haggai, we're going to have to do a little history lesson. No yawning. No, no yawning. I know some of y'all are like, oh no, history. <sighs> but you see, it's really important for us to lay the backstory of Haggai. If not, we won't know why God called him up. We won't know why God had him give the message that he gave. And to be honest, it's going to help us have that solid life. So let's go ahead and look a little bit into this history lesson just to begin. Please don't tune out, Hannah. I know you don't care for history, but I'll try to make it imp- impressive, okay? Remember, hashtag solid life, right? Hashtag solid life. All right. Well, what happened is the Jewish nation had been in exile. They had broken the covenant with God. God had raised up the Babylonians, and Nebuchadnezzar had taken them from the land of Israel, Judah, technically, to Babylon. And they had been there a long time. They had paid severely for turning their backs on God. Jeremiah had prophesied to the Hebrew people that they would be in exile for 70 years. And the time was about to come. And that is where we're going to pick up our story. The Hebrew children are in exile in Babylon. And the king Cyrus has come into power. We're going to start our lesson today, not in the book of Haggai, but in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, the first couple of chapters, actually paints the picture of what was happening right before Haggai came came up. 
before God raised him up to be a prophet to the nation. So let's go ahead and start in Ezra 1, and we're going to find out the backstory to the book of Haggai. And we're going to look today at how we can have a hashtag solid life. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put into writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with freewill offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites everywhere whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, where Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazzar, the prince of Judah. And then it goes on as you're reading the, over the next couple of verses. It gives like an inventory of what was given to Sheshbazzar to take. And then the entire next chapter, chapter 2, talks about all the names of the people who came back. Approximately 42,000 people went back in this journey. Now... You may be thinking, well, that's wonderful. That's great news. But how in the world does an edict of a king who is dead and gone have to deal with my life today? And how in the world is that going to help me to build a solid life? Well, that's a great question. Let me explain. Okay, you good? Still with me? Yeah, not yawning on me, are you? Not, not tired? Okay, awesome. Well, here we go. Well, these individuals were commissioned to rebuild a temple back in Jerusalem. They were given a particular work to go and rebuild that which was destroyed. In other words, they were, they were given a specific task by the king to go back to Jerusalem from where they came and put it all back into order. Cyrus had decreed it, and believe me, Cyrus always got what he wanted. What he said went. He was the boss. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to my words. We are in that same position today. We have not been told to go and rebuild a physical temple. We have not been told to go and put brick upon brick to make, uh, or a mortar to make this physical structure so that other people can see. But we are, have been called to rebuild a temple. A temple that has been destroyed. You see, before Jesus, my life was in ruins. And God had called me to start putting things into place and rebuild this temple. Just like what Cyrus did with those people, giving them the tools they needed to fulfill that mission. Jesus has given me the tools to put into place in my own life to start rebuilding my life. What am I saying? I am saying that... You see, Paul says that our God no longer lives in a temple made with hands. In 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, he goes on and he says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have been given an assignment to rebuild a place of worship within our lives and hearts. We have been given an assignment to put the things in our hearts that's going to help us to focus solely on him. As we rebuild the temple of worship in our lives on the proper foundation, which is Jesus Christ, our lives will become solid. 
It is only as we learn to build our life on that foundation of Jesus and allow that place of worship within our hearts to become a worshiper in spirit and truth on him will we ever have stability in our lives. The amazing thing is, is God has not called us to rebuild this place of worship, to, to live our lives on that foundation. He has not called us to do it by ourselves. He has given us the Holy Spirit who will rebuild our lives with us. Just like King Cyrus decreed that all the lands around them give them the supplies they needed, God has given us everything. So that, that pertains to liveliness and godliness is what the Bible says. So that our lives can be made strong in him. We don't have to have a life that is wishy-washy. But we can have a life that is solid as we learn to place our hope in him. And as we learn to build that place of worship within our own lives. We have been called to do this, ladies and gentlemen. We have been commissioned not by King Cyrus, but by the King of Kings. Jesus, to be strong worshipers of him. But that's not all. Not only was this temple supposed to be a, a place of worship, but this temple was a physical representation to the nations around them about the testimony of God. So these men were given a charge by the king to let other nations know that there is a God in Israel, that God is faithful, that God keeps his promises, that God does not forsake his people. By rebuilding the temple, that is what these people are saying. We too have been given this assignment to let others know that our God is faithful. And that our testimony of him is true. And that we can trust him. Look at these verses. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. We just sang about that, didn't we? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He goes on in Acts 1 and says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So you can have goosebumps and great worship services. No, that's not what he says. He says the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? So you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Church, that is what God has called us to do. We are not here to rebuild a, a, a temple in our own lives for us to, shall I say, worship our own little things that we want to do. We have been called to be witnesses of Jesus as God with us rebuilds our lives to become strong and steady and solid. We become a testimony to those around us who may be freaking out by watching the news that our God is strong. Our God is faithful. Our God does not forsake his people. Our God is a God who walks with us through every step of the way. It is when we are strong and solid that we are a testimony to those who are freaking out. We will not become people of fear. In fact, normally I say turn to your neighbor and say that, but say it to yourself and to your mask. We will not become people of fear. We will have a hashtag solid life. Why? Because God is with us as we rebuild this temple. We will have a place of worship and we will be a testimony to the nations. In order to have a hashtag solid life, we must reestablish God as first place in our lives and allow our lives to be a testimony for him. I wish I could stop there. I wish I could say that, hey, these guys came, they, they built the foundation, they never stopped, they kept going, they rebuilt the temple, and it was great. But unfortunately... We're going to find out that there's challenges. There is a challenge to every call. There was a challenge to the call placed on these men 
And there is a challenge to every call God places on you. In fact, the title today that I was going to call it was The Challenge Comes with the Call. The Challenge Comes with the Call. We're about to look at a few very real things that these individuals faced. It was things that they, some of them were able to get past, but then others stopped the work because of it. My challenge to you today is as we're going through these things, recognize it in your life and don't let them stop you from accomplishing what God has called you to do. Because with every call comes a challenge. We're going to pick up in Ezra 3, right after they built the altar, right after they reestablished that in Israel, that is what we're going to pick up. Ezra 3, verses 8 through 13. In the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shentiel, Joshua, son of Jezadok, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who returned from the captivity of Jerusalem, began to work. They started well. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Hinnadad and the sons and brothers, all Levites joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. Notice the declaration of faith there. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It was a festival beyond festival. You can imagine the joy, right? Guess what? It did not just go that way. If you read, when we read the next verses, you're going to be shocked at what happens. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Did you find that interesting? You had one group, especially the younger group, that was shouting with joy because they were coming back and the temple was being rebuilt. It was a joyous occasion for them. But then you had the older crowd weeping so loudly, you couldn't tell if it was a festival of praise or if it was a time to mourn. What happened? What was going on there? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's the first test. It's the first test these people went through, and it's going to be one of the tests that you're going to go through as you're trying to build a solid life. And that test is the test of comparison. The test of comparison. The older group looked at this new construction and said, it's never going to be as good as what the previous group built. It's never going to live up with what we really wanted to do. It's not as good as Joe Blow's church down the way. If you want to put it in today's group. That comparison was so strong, it knocked some out of the work. So what are you comparing yourself to today? Who is it that you're looking at going, I wish I was like so-and-so. I wish I was as smart as 
so-and-so. I wish I had a better figure. I wish that I made more money. I wish that I looked more handsome. Of course, in my case, I don't have to worry about that. But thank you for not laughing. Well, who are you comparing yourself to? That comparison can rob you from what God is calling you to. Sometimes we compare our physical attributes, don't we? Other times, it's financial. Sometimes it's mental. Sometimes we compare ourselves to people who may have better connections than us. It's not fair, God. If I knew so-and-so, my life would be so much better. Comparison. Comparison. It could be anything, but when we compare ourselves to other people, we rob ourselves of what God has put in our lives. However, I want to touch upon a different form of comparison today. It's really what was going on here. It seems that a lot of what we see in these verses has to do with the comparison of the good old days. Do you see it? The temple wasn't as good as the one that Solomon built. How does that affect us? It's basically holding on to the ways of past revivals and not looking forward to the new thing God is doing today. Oh, I remember back in the 60s, brother. We had church all day long, and it was the greatest thing. What is God doing now? What is God doing in your life, specifically now? Don't continue to look back and go, oh, I wish, because that comparison can rob you of the joy of what God is doing now. This end-time revival that's coming, that I believe, is not going to be like the Welsh Revival. It's not going to be like the Great Awakening or the Second Great Awakening. It's not going to even be like Azusa Street. This re revival is going to be different because this, the times are different. People are different. This revival is going to be strong, though. And we're going to be able to see lives change forever. We're going to be seeing families restored. We're going to be seeing signs and wonders. We're going to be seeing God moving miraculously. That I do know is going to happen. We're going to be seeing salvations like you cannot imagine coming in droves. Why? Because God is in the midst. But we can't hang on to the old revivals and say, I wish we did church the old way. I wish that we sang the old songs. I wish we had prayer meetings like the old ways. Because that is not what God is calling us to. We have to learn to let go of the Solomon's temple in order to walk in the temple that God's placing before us. Ladies and gentlemen, let us not be tied to the memories of the past so much we lose our sight for the promise that is coming on the horizon. God is still moving, but it's not by the methods or ways that we used to do things. It is by what he is doing now. Notice Jesus always said, what is the spirit saying? Not so much, what did the spirit say in the past? We should be spending our time with him so we're hearing what he's saying. That we're moving the way he moves. And know that his promise is going to come forth. Don't look back. Look up. God is doing a new thing. And we're going to see him move with signs and wonders. And we're going to see his be faithful to the end. Amen. Don't let the, that comparison ruin what God is doing in your life today. Don't let him. Don't let it. That trap got some of those people, and they quit, primarily the older people. And we're going to read about it again in Haggai. Don't let that trap get you either. Don't fall for the trap of comparison. There was another trap, though, that comes and attacks these people. And guess what? It'll try to get you as well. Let's keep reading, and we're going to pick up. In Ezra 4, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the family and said, hey, let us help you build it because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of that crazy long word, Ezra Hayden, king of Assyria, who brought us here. 
That looks like a good thing. Kind of. It's kind of weird that's the enemies, though. I'll explain that in a minute. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. This trap is the trap of compromise. The trap of compromise. How do you say that, David? Well, let me explain. This looked like a good thing. We had people come and say, I want to help. But these were the enemies of those trying to rebuild. This particular group had been there many years before underneath this king of Assyria. It was basically the Samaritans at the time. They they were from Samaria. And they didn't worship the Lord wholeheartedly. What all the commentary said about these individuals is they took the worship of Yahweh, the worship of God, and they mixed them with all their other false religions. And so when they came and they said, hey, we worship him, they're really not meaning, hey, we worship him alone. One, one translation said, we worship him as you do. Yeah. And Zerubbabel and them was like, no, 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 Jack, you don't get it. We don't mix God with these other false idols. It's either God and nothing else, or it's not even worrying about God. You see, compromise is what these people were tempted with. If you want a hashtag solid life, you need to be singularly focused On serving God alone. Let me say that again. If you want a solid life, you have to be singularly focused in worshiping God alone. Jesus said it this way. You cannot have two masters. You will serve one and love the other. You will love one and and hate the other. Thank you for some reason. Either way, you can't do it. Can't have your cake and eat it too. You, Jesus said you, you can only serve one. As one preacher said, either Jesus is Lord of all in your life or he's not Lord of all. You cannot live a life of partial obedience. Whenever you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you become his disciple. And in doing that, you deny yourself daily. Does that mean I go around, hit myself, or beat myself? And I, no, not at all. But what it does mean is I look at life through the lens of that Bible, and I follow what it says, and I live a life of servitude. I live a life through the lens of Jesus. Everything that I, I come across, I look at it through his lens. I'm going to share the love of Jesus. I'm going to minister through the power of Jesus. I'm going to talk to others with the idea that Jesus wants a relationship with them. Everything is through serving Jesus. What would the Father want me to do? That's what Jesus did. He did only what the Father did. And that is what we are called to do. To do only what the Father wants us to do. We are not called to a life of partial obedience. The enemy will try whatever means necessary to get you to sin even just a little bit. He wants you to walk away from the job of rebuilding the temple. He wants you to ruin your testimony by just one outbreak Of living the way you're not supposed to live. Did you know it just takes one time for you to lose your cool and like downgrade somebody with your mouth for you to lose their testimony to that individual? What if you have been witnessing to a co-worker or a friend for years? And then all of a sudden you lose it and you go off at it on them. The enemy could twist that so easily. And you will have ruined your testimony. God has not called us to a life of partial obedience, but a full obedience to him. We will not let compromise 
trip us up because it did some of these people. What does the Bible say? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We don't want to be wishy-washy. We want to what? Hashtag solid life. Got quiet there. All right. Well, let's keep on going. We're about to see where the Jews took their biggest hit. We're about to see what it was that made the majority of them stop working on the call that, call that God called them to. And it is one of the largest, greatest tools of the enemy that he uses to try to stop you and me. Let's look at that. And it's continued in Ezra 4. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This tactic was discouragement and fear. Discouragement and fear. One of the greatest tools of the enemy to get you to stop what God's called you to. And notice that this didn't just go on for just a little bit of time, but a long time. Cyrus all the way through Darius. The enemy will try to discourage you by letting life hit you in the face over and over and over again. And what's going to happen is sometimes you'll even go, what's the use? Why am I trying to live like this? Why should I try to put my life back in order? Because everything seems to be happening. Let me remind you, the challenge comes with the call. Have you been called by God? Yes, you have been called, so there will be a challenge. You see, if the enemy cannot get you to compare yourself to other people, if he cannot get you to compromise with the life of sin, he will try as hard as he can to discourage you and get you to operate out of fear. Because when we operate out of fear, we are not operating in faith of what God called us to do. These people stopped work for approximately 14 years because they were discouraged and afraid. 14 years. The temple laid there and nothing was done. They resigned to the fact that maybe the best thing for them to do was sit back and do nothing. Maybe if they did nothing, then nothing bad would happen to them. They decided that they weren't up to the challenge of being consistently hit in the face. Maybe the best thing was for them to sit back. But let me tell you, resignation kills faith. When we decide to just sit back and do nothing, our faith, for some reason, starts to diminish. God has called us as an army to move forward. God has called us to step out in faith. It is a walk of faith. We are not going to sit back and be resigned. Every call comes with a challenge. Every success in life comes with difficulties. Every testimony has a test, right? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty. But from the strength of an ox comes abundant harvest. What am I saying? To have a solid life, you must know that there's going to be difficulties Trials and tribulations you have to deal with if you truly want success. Think about it. It's, it's the way it works. Do you want to get out of debt? Anybody in here like have financial debt and you want to get out? Okay. Anybody online? Okay. Budget. You're going to have to work self-discipline through the budget to help you get out of debt. What's the trial and tribulation there? I don't get to go buy whatever I want when I want to go buy it. All right. Let's keep going. Um, Anybody want to get in better shape? What do we have to continue to work through? Well, we have to eat and we have to eat right and exercise. You, you want a better job? Well, then you should invest in training, which isn't easy. It's work. But anytime you want to see success in life, you have to work through the process, through that trial and tribulation to be able to see success. The key is not to quit. 
Everybody in your mask, say not to quit. Not to quit. God has called us not to quit. And that's what happens here. That is why God is going to send Haggai on the scene. 14 years of not fulfilling the call of God on their lives. 14 years of not being a testimony to the nations that he is true and faithful. 14 years of not preparing a proper place of worship for him. God's called each and every single one of us to do that in our lives. What is keeping you from fulfilling God's dream for your life? God is calling you to a solid life. Does comparison make you feel insignificant? Why bother? Why try? It's not going to be good enough anyway. Is, <laughs> Do you give in to compromise and allow your life to self-destruct? Eh, just this one time won't hurt. Nobody will ever know. Or... Do you give in and quit to the challenge of discouragement and fear? These individuals fell into these traps. I don't, I'm not going to downgrade them because I've fallen into those traps many a times. But with God's help, we're going to build our lives as a solid life. Let's pray. Father, each one of us don't want a life that's all messed up or screwed up. We want our lives to be solid. We want to be solid for our family. We want to be solid for our friends. and We want a life that's not thrown to or fro because of news reports. And Father, we know that, first of all, the only way that that could even begin is by having a relationship with you. So there may be some that are checking in online that they've never started a walk with you. Their life, they know, is nowhere near solid. And they need you, Father. And they know they need you. So, Father, I pray for these individuals. I pray, Father, that they would give their hearts to you. And if you're listening right now and you're there, just... Go ahead and say, Father, forgive me. I know I've messed up. I need your help. And he'll do that. He will help you. But then there's others, Lord, that they compare themselves and, and they allow the mirror of comparison be like that funny carnival mirror where it makes them look different than who they really are. They may have a little head and a big body in that mirror or a little body and a giant giraffe head. That's what comparison does to us, Father. Comparison makes us see ourselves not the way that we are. It makes us distorted. And Father, it makes us not see the strengths that you've placed within us. There may be others, Lord, that are dealing with compromise and, and they're continuing to give in to sin and, and not living a life of an overcomer. Father, I, I pray for these individuals as well. I pray also, Lord, for those that are dealing with discouragement and fear. Father, in all three categories, I ask that you would give these individuals what they need. For those that are comparing themselves, let them see who they are in Christ. For those that are compromising, let them see that they need the life of a holy, holy one. And for those that are discouraged in fear, let them see that the God of all creation is with them. God, I pray that each and every single one of us rebuild the temple that you've called us to. And that we don't quit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be an interesting ride. Uh, we'll actually start Haggai next week. So if you want, you can go ahead and start looking at that book this week. Start reading through. It's very short, only two chapters. But uh, I'm excited about what God is going to do. We're going to continue to look at how to build a solid life. Amen? Amen. Well, guys, on your way out today, we're going to ask that all fellowshipping and everything be done outside to maintain social distancing. 
We'll go out this door right over here, uh, the one with the exit sign. Uh, if you brought your tithes and offering, just place it into the, the basket.